Okay, I'm ready. Hallelujah. Yes. Listen, man. You see this Christianity thing? This is no joke. Sometimes I am shocked at how the Holy Spirit works. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, he is Lord, Lord of all. That deserves a hallelujah. You know, it is amazing to me how the Holy Spirit will prepare our hearts to receive from the Word of God. This morning I'm starting a new series of messages for our Lenten season. And it is looking once again at the life and ministry of Jesus, but from a different angle. We talk about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when you hear the word gospel, you're thinking about the good news of Jesus Christ. The fact that he came from heaven to earth, he took on flesh, and he died an ignominious death on a cross on behalf of us, every single one of us, to pay for our sins so that whoever, as the word of God says, believes in him, will not perish but have everlasting life. That is the, the wider story of the gospel, a summary of the gospel. However, within the gospel story, there are little gospels. There are little good news. There's, there's little stories of good news that are scattered throughout Jesus' story. And that's what we're going to look at. We're going to look back at the stories of his ministry, but we're going to see that within each of these stories, there's some good news for us today. As we are going through our particular situations and circumstances in life, God is reminding us through the life of Jesus Christ that he is with us, that he is there to help us, and that he can give context to what we're going through. Have you ever been going through something and think to yourself, why is God allowing me to go through this? Or is God even real if he is allowing me to go through this very negative thing? Well, hopefully as we look at these things, we will see that God is in control from beginning to end, not just of the things that make us feel good, but also of the things that, that challenge us, things that might not make us feel very good. And it is in knowing this that gives us hope for what we're going through. Why? Because it's not random. It's not that God is powerless. It is that God is interested in preparing us for glory, in developing righteousness within us so that we might be his beloved children. That's what it's all about. And so we're going to begin today by looking at the gospel of the wilderness. The gospel of the wilderness. Let's pray. Father, in these few moments, I ask you, please speak to us. Lord, help us as we look at the life of Jesus and as we look at him going through the wilderness in his own experience. I pray, Lord, that we can identify with him. He's a sympathetic high, high priest who is acquainted with what we've gone, we've gone through and what we're going through. And so he can be sympathetic and helpful to us in what we go through. Teach us, Heavenly Father, as we look at this familiar story once more. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 4. It's also found in Matthew chapter 4. This is the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Let me give you context here. Jesus has just been established, not just within his mind and his relationship with his father, but in public, it has been demonstrated that this Jesus is the one who has been called to do this great work. How do we know this? The Bible says that he came to John the Baptist in the wilderness, and John the Baptist saw him and said, look, this man, I am not worthy to even unshackle his, um, his shoes. He is 
the Messiah. He is the one. And as he baptized Jesus, a dove came down and there was a voice from heaven that says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And so this is the beginning of Jesus' public ministry. And now we see the Messiah being established before people. And you would expect that knowing these things, Jesus would go immediately into the cities or immediately go to the towns and begin to spread the gospel. But the Bible says the first thing that Jesus does once this thing happens is he is sent by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness. That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> After this grand official announcement, why is Jesus going by himself into a dangerous wilderness. We're talking about a place where there is lack of food, lack of water, where there are wild animals, where there's all kinds of dangers, rugged terrain, all these things. Why would the Holy Spirit lead Jesus into the wilderness by himself when there is a public ministry that has just begun? Well, I can tell you this. It's because he wants to teach us something. He wants to give us some good news. You may not see it on the surface, but this is right there within the context because guess what? Jesus is not the only one that goes through a wilderness experience. You and I do as well. Have you ever been in a place in your life where you are totally physically, mentally, emotionally, distraught you're in a place where there are little answers where you are wondering if God loves you why are you in this place Let me say this my friend Jesus went into the wilderness for you and for me to help us to understand that that wilderness experience that you're going through he knows how you feel but he also knows how to make it through. And that's the good news of the wilderness. You see, the wilderness itself is not good news, but there's good news as you make it through the wilderness. Because as you make it through, you are even better prepared to do what God is calling you to do. Jesus, the Son of God, who we know was perfect, still had to go through the wilderness. Why? To set an example for us as we make it through our own wilderness. Now, I'm not going to read the whole context here, but when you get the chance, read Luke chapter 4, and it will once again teach you what Jesus had to go through. But what I'll do is I'll just highlight particular portions of Scripture that help us to understand the good news that we learn from Jesus' experience. The first thing is this. It's found in verse 1. It says there, And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan, that's where he got baptized, and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness. Now notice two times in that verse. Jesus is full of the Spirit. And then at the latter part of the verse it says, He was led by the Spirit in the wilderness. And I think the Bible, the Holy Spirit, is highlighting this for us in a very important way. The first thing about the wilderness that you have to understand, and the first thing you have to know in order to understand that it is good news going through the wilderness, is this. God leads you there. God leads you there. You say, well, Pastor Andrew, that doesn't sound like good news. Well, let me tell you why it's good news. You see, the world will dictate to you that so many things that happen wrong in our lives happen because of chance. It happens because of circumstances. It happens randomly. And so because of that, it's hard to prepare for it. And because of that, it's hard to see any meaning in it. But let me say this, for the child of God, there is nothing that happens to you that has not happened by design. And you have to understand it when it comes to trouble and tribulation, not just when it comes to things that are good and things that feel good. 
You have to understand it in terms of trouble and tribulation. Why? Because, my friends, if you haven't learned this yet, there are some lessons that you can't learn unless you go through difficulty. We would all love to live lives where there was not a bill that we didn't have to pay, where there was no trouble and tribulation in our families, where we didn't have to, to, to work hard to get things and stuff like that. We all want an easy life. We all want a life that is stress-free. But if you can look back at your life right now, some of the greatest lessons of life you've ever learned have been in those difficult wilderness experiences. Your understanding of God, your understanding of yourself, your understanding of circumstances and people and the way people respond to things. So many of those lessons could not have been learned if it weren't for some hard times. Not true. Yes. But know this, those hard times are not random. Those hard times were actually set up in the mind of God in eternity past for you because God knows exactly what you need in order to be everything he wants you to be. Jesus was the son of God, perfect in any way, but yet still he was led by the Spirit into a difficult place. And it is not, it is not insignificant that that difficult place came right after a glorious and wonderful place. <laughs> He's baptized. Everybody's looking at him as the Messiah. You would think smooth sailing from here. No. Jesus had to fulfill all righteousness. He had to fulfill all prophecy. And part of that was understanding what you and I go through. And so he had to go into the wilderness. God leads you there. It's not random. When you are in the wilderness, it is not a sign that God has forsaken you or that God hates you. When you are in the wilderness, it is not a sign that God is not in control of things. On the contrary, for the child of God, it is a sign that God has something he's trying to teach you. That's all it is. A lot of us don't like hard lessons. We would rather just, you know, have you ever watched The Matrix where, you know, if you want to learn how to do karate, they just stick something in your head and you just upload it? Like you wish life was like that. <laughs> but that's not life. Sometimes you have to walk through it, experience it in order to get it. And that's God. He loves you. He's in control. And sometimes he guides you to those kinds of things. Jesus is hungry. Jesus is thirsty. Jesus is lonely. Jesus is in despair. Jesus is in danger. So when Jesus says he's a sympathetic high priest and he knows what you're going through, it's not just words. He's been there. Maybe in circumstances way more dangerous than we can even understand. For 40 days and 40 nights, he is in that place. For many of us, if we go through a problem, sometimes in retrospect, it feels like an eternity. And for some of us, it's just a couple days. <laughs> Jesus was in this thing and in it for a while. Do you know what it is to be hungry for a day, much more for 40 days? Jesus knows what we're going through. And there are some things you can't learn without the wilderness. The guiding hand of God gives you hope for your trouble. If you know that it's not random, if you know that God brought you to it, you will also know that he's going to take you through it. And you will also know that there must be some kind of a good purpose that he's working through it. Why? Because God loves me. So even if it doesn't feel good, there must be a good purpose here. And that gives you hope. And there's nothing like going through a difficult time with hope in your heart. It changes the way you view your problems. The Bible says in Psalm chapter 139, verse 9, 
It says there, if I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall what? Lead me. And your right hand shall hold me. That means God had a hand there. <laughs> Even though I'm way out there in the sea, I know he led me there. So I know there's hope for me. If I don't know he led me there, there is no hope for me. And one of the worst things about going through difficulty is going through it without hope. Even in the verse of scripture that we know so well in Psalm, one, in, in Psalm 23, where it says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Now check this out. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. A lot of people don't understand what that means. For a shepherd, there were two important tools you needed when you were guiding sheep. You needed a rod and you needed a staff. The rod was kind of like a club. It was a club that you would use. If anybody was trying to attack the sheep, if there was a wild animal trying to get at the sheep, this is what you use to defend them, your rod, the club. So you hit whatever it is that is trying to get to the sheep. But more than likely, you would use your staff more than you use your rod. You know why you would use a staff? The staff is a long stick with a hook at the bottom. And what you would do with the staff is, anytime a sheep is moving out of line, which they do quite a lot, you would take your staff, and because it was long, if they fell down into a brook or they fell into a ditch, you could wrap the staff around the sheep and pull them out. It was a way in which you would keep the sheep together and heading in the direction they need to go. So the staff was used a lot more than the rod. But you know what that tells me? The Bible says there, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. How does a rod and a staff comfort me? Because I'm the sheep and the Lord is my shepherd. So I know one, he's going to defend me with his rod. And I know that wherever he's leading me, he's going to guide me with his staff. So I am comforted by that. I know that God is in control of everything, even if it looks like I'm walking through the valley of the shadow of death. I am comforted by the fact that God is with me and is guiding me through. There's nothing like knowing that God leads you. In shady green pastures, so rich and so sweet, God leads his dear children along. Don't you dare think that God has abandoned you when you're going through your wilderness. No, he's right there doing what he's always done, loving you, caring for you, protecting you, and about to show you something new about himself. That's why you're going through it. The second thing is this. The second part of the good news of the wilderness is, not only does God lead you there, God understands the struggle. <laughs> he understands the struggle. If you read the story of the temptation of Jesus, you will see that the devil came to him three times. And the devil addresses the three things that most of us as human beings struggle with. He goes right after those three things, and then we see how Jesus responds to those three things. The three things are this, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. How, is he, how does he come with the lust of the flesh? The lust of the flesh is that which we think we need for our bodies in order to be okay. So the first thing he does is this. Well, you haven't eaten for 40 days and 40 nights, Jesus. Why don't you turn this stone into bread? Which seems like a good idea when you're hungry. Doesn't Jesus have the power to do that? Of course he does. So why didn't he do that upon the request of Satan? It is because Satan doesn't have to dictate what you do in the wilderness you can still do what the Father in heaven wants you to do in spite of, obviously, the deficiencies to your own flesh. 
In other words, Jesus is trying to teach us this. We walk by the spirit, not by the flesh. Meaning, even if my body is desirous of certain things, I don't have to give in to those cravings because I believe that if I honor God, if I do what God wants me to do, things will be better for me. And that's why Jesus says to Satan, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. In other words, my flesh is not more powerful than the Spirit of God that is within me, guiding me through this wilderness. Yes, it's been 40 days and 40 nights. Yes, it's been difficult. Yes, I may be hungry, but I believe that life is more than just food for me. Life is about honoring the Father. So Jesus overcame the lust of the flesh by simply saying to Satan, you don't tell me what to do. My flesh doesn't tell me what to do. The Father in heaven does. And he overcame that. Next came the lust of the eyes, what we see. And you talk about a time and an age where what we see is what guides so many of us in terms of what we prioritize. You see this thing called social media? Where there is just such, the impression that you give of yourself is so important to the way you think and feel about yourself. What an insidious idea that we gain our worth from the way people look at us. God never created us that way. God created us to know our worth from him. To understand our worth from what he says, not from what people say. But the lust of the eyes will deceive us into thinking that we need that. That the only way we're going to survive the wilderness is if we're able to gain what it is that is attractive to us. He takes Jesus up into the mountains and shows him all the kingdoms of the world and says, I will give them to you if you will but bow down and worship me. The lust of the eyes. But Jesus... <laughs> Again, by his power, he looks out. And you can hear echoes of the word of God saying, What shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Jesus was showing you and me within the wilderness that just because it looks attractive, just because it looks like something that's going to bring satisfaction, that doesn't mean that it will if it goes against God's will for you. Because God's will for us is more important than what is right before our eyes that's attractive. That's a hard lesson to learn in the wilderness. But Jesus is trying to show us that. That even in the midst of all of the things that we see, that we might say that we want, it is still always more important to worship God and to serve him only. That is safety and protection for you in the wilderness. So he overcomes the lust of the flesh. He overcomes the lust of the eyes. But he also overcomes probably our greatest fear, the pride of life. Many of us, we think to ourselves, well, I only get this one life. And I have to try to find satisfaction and peace with this life. I have to try to preserve this life by any means necessary. I have to preserve my comfort by any means necessary. I have to preserve my peace of mind by any means necessary. Even if it means trying to find a way out of the wilderness. But Jesus is showing us right here in the temptation that he faced that you don't have to avoid this idea of life being important, while at the same time you can affirm the fact that your life is safest when it is committed to, to glorifying God and honoring God. He takes him up on the pinnacle of the temple and says, hey, if you really are who you say you are, jump off. Didn't the Bible say that God will let his angels have charge over you so you won't dash your foot against a stone? You know, Satan is so presumptuous to want to use the word of God against the one who wrote it. <laughs> presumptuous. Wow. And he'll do that. He'll try and trick you. He'll try and justify things by saying, what? Wait, the Bible isn't too clear on this. Why don't you go ahead? It's very reminiscent 
of what he did to Adam in the garden, where he says to him, did God really say that? You won't surely die, right? But you see, where the first Adam failed, the second Adam succeeded. He said, look, you will not put God to the test. So don't use your fancy words or your interpretations to try to trick me away from the will of God. You see, every struggle you face comes into those three categories. Every single one. Think about it. Every sin we are tempted to commit falls into the category of the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. So let me say this, my friend. When you think to yourself, man, I'm going through something and I don't know how I'm going to overcome it, or I don't think anybody else has ever seen what I'm seeing, I have to give in to it because I don't know if I have the strength not to. Remember this. Jesus understands the struggle. The Bible says he was tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin. Why? To set us an example of what we can accomplish in the wilderness. Jesus could have easily given in to any one of those temptations for practical reasons. But he chose against them. Why? Because he wants us to understand that we have good news in the wilderness. You don't have to give in. You don't have to give up. You can stand strong and survive and thrive even in the midst of the wilderness if you will honor God and keep him first. The good news of the wilderness is God leads you there. The good news of the wilderness is he understands your struggle more than anyone else. It's a wonderful and beautiful thing to know God in this way. God is able by his power to keep you, to preserve you, and to present you at the end successful. The Bible says in Hebrews 4 verse 14, since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. The Bible is a very practical book. It's not all theory or pie-in-the-sky ideas. And Jesus, what he presents to you and me is not just a ticket to heaven. It's a ticket to life, to understanding true happiness and true life. Jesus gives that to us. And then thirdly and finally, not only does he lead us, not only does he understand the struggles, the wilderness does not last forever, and God will bring comfort to you and me. You know, in Matthew chapter 4, after Jesus tells him, you shall not tempt the Lord your God, the Bible says that the Satan left him for a season. But guess what? When Satan left him, angels came and ministered to him, or served him, or comforted him. Why? Because God knows how hard the wilderness is. You know, I've heard a lot of people say, you know, you don't have to sin. That if you're just focused all the time, sin won't even be a part of your life. I think that's, that's very idealistic. It would be nice. It would be nice if that was the way it was. But the greatest struggle of every Christian's life is sin. We all know this. It is hard. Sometimes we find victory. Sometimes we fail. At all times we receive the grace and goodness of God, and we thank God for that. But it is not easy. 
It is not easy. I remember one of my first messages, and I wish I could go back and fix that message. I was maybe, what, 14 or 15 years old, and I preached this message at my church at the time. And it was basically like, you know, this, this Christian life is easy. All we have to do is please God and everything will be fine. And I said, boy, ah, man, just a kid, just, just a kid, not even understanding fully the struggle yet. But now that I've understood, or I'm still understanding the struggle, I realize just how blessed we are that in spite of the struggle, God gives us some good news. Number one, the wilderness may feel long, but it will not last forever. God knows how much we can bear. If every day of our lives we are being bombarded by sin, by temptation, if every day of our lives there is no sunlight, we are going to fall into depression and we're going to be overrun by the things that we're facing. But every now and then, especially when we need it most, the sun comes through and God reminds us, hey, it's over. The wilderness is over. And you did it. You made it through. You didn't think you were going to make it through, but you made it. Thank God. And you feel that sunlight and you feel good and you keep going along. And then that next wilderness comes along and you think, oh my goodness, it's a horrible thing. And it, the same thing happens again. He takes you through it. When have you ever been in a wilderness that was everlasting? God knows what we can bear, and he will never give us more than we can bear, even if it feels like he's given us more than we can bear. Trust God. He knows how much you can bear. And not just that, because one of the beautiful things about the wilderness is what God sends to his son. God sends angels to comfort him to minister to him. It doesn't say exactly what they did. Maybe they brought him food. Maybe they just kept him warm at night. Whatever it is that God sent these angels to do, they did it for his comfort. You know, angels come in many forms. Sometimes angels can come as people to encourage us in our darkest times. Sometimes angels can come as the word of God coming back to you, a reminder of a verse that was so important to what you're going through. Sometimes an angel is sometimes even somebody who doesn't know God, who God uses to alleviate the wilderness. Because God can do that. And God wants to remind you, hey, look, I'm a loving father. I'm not throwing you to the wolves. I'm just taking you through basic training. But at the end of training, you get up in your ranks. You know some things. You're more skilled for the fight. It doesn't end with the wilderness. No, it's just preparation for deeper, stronger walk with God. You can ask anyone who's been through a lot of difficulties in their faith. It will either make you very bitter or will make you extremely strong. And your faith in God will be unshakable, unbreakable. I'm at a point in my life right now where nobody can tell me nothing. Like when it comes to God, you might not believe, you might curse him. I'm sorry. You're not going to get me to do that. <laughs> no, I know my God. I know my God, hallelujah. And I'm thankful for the wildernesses. They don't feel good at the time, but it is through those that I've learned the most about my God. He is the God, not just of the mountains, he's the God of the valley as well. I wanna close with this verse, Philippians chapter four. Verse 10 says, I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at length you have received, you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound 
in any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's a mature Christian who's been through some wildernesses. That's someone who understands what wildernesses are for. Because I don't have to abound just when things are going great. I can abound in the valley as well. I can abound in the hard times as well. Because I know what the valley is doing in my heart, in my life. It's preparing me for deeper righteousness. What a wonderful thing that God will comfort us with the wilderness, that there is good news there. If you are going through a wilderness right now and it's making you shaky in your faith, remember this, God led you there. He knows what he is doing. Remember this, because God will never give you more than you can bear. Remember that he understands the struggle. He's been there. <laughs> He knows it. And remember, it doesn't last forever. And he will bring you comfort when you need it the most. And so all of us here can testify to that. In our darkest time, God brings a song. God brings a comfort and a joy that we need, that we really need. We thank him for that. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for this word. Thank you for the gospel of Jesus Christ, which, is, which encompasses your salvation work for us on the cross. But Lord, thank you for these small messages of good news in what you did. Remind us to us that we can make it through. I pray for everyone going through a struggle right now or multiple struggles. I pray right now, Father, you will refocus us, give us hope. And when all is said and done, Father, remind us that it won't last forever. Send your angels to comfort our hearts and to show us, Lord, that we are not forsaken. We are not alone. That you, O oh Father, will never forsake us. You will never leave us. I thank you for this. In Jesus' name, amen.